So I'm going to play you the first movie here, where we're going to, you're going to see the Odessa movie. Here is, this is the back, uh, but, excuse me, this is not the back, this is the thigh, okay, on the subject, right over the, the rectus femoris. And um, you see here the skin, very thin, this is a very thin subject, a little bit of subcutaneous connective tissue. And here are the two layers of perimuscular fascia right here, and this is the muscle, okay? And then look at the upper left corner of the image. You'll see when the needle is moving up and down, you're going to see a, just a small amount of up and down movement. And I'm going to play the movie now. So do you see this? Just a little bit of movement up and down. It's not major. It's just a small amount of manipulation. The needle simply oscillated up and down. What we do then is we use a technique. We use cross correlation okay, <coughs> that uh, analyze the image by correlating the pixel uh, movement from one image to the next. And it generates a series of color images where red indicates movement upwards towards the skin and blue indicates movement downwards, away away from the skin. And what you're going to see is you're going to see these <coughs> kind of waves of color that move across the image. And this is this corresponds to the, uh, the B-scan, uh, the ultrasound that I just showed you. And I, what I want you to notice is that first of all, there's going to be these wave alternating red and blue waves that are going to go across. But I want you to see how far across the image this goes. The image is four centimeters across. And you'll see the waves going all the way across the image. Okay, so here's the movie. And so you see now uh, there, there's, there's this blue wave that's followed by a orange, reddish wave, then a blue, another blue one, and the orange one. And you see that it's not just confined to where the needle was. It's all the way across. But these are very, very small displacements. These are displacements of the order of microns. Okay, very, very small, but this is a very sensitive technique, so it's able to pick it up. But the, the fascinating thing about it is that we know from our cell experiments in the mass that the type of displacement that the cells respond to is also very, very small. The cells are very, very sensitive. So what we think is that the, those types of displacements that we see as in response to mechanical <coughs> stimulation by the needle are probably enough of, this, of a right order of magnitude to initiate changes in the cells. So we think that this is something, we don't know how far this goes, okay, because we haven't been able to do synchronize with, you know, several probes, ultrasound probe going further and further away. We're still working on that. But we think that this at least is, is something that could go several centimeters away from the needle in human. Another interesting thing is there's a lot of talk about uh, sham acupuncture, and we're going to talk about that in the, in the panel discussion tomorrow with Vitaly uh, Napadov. But um, I just want to, just in relationship to what I just showed you, um, this is very interesting. What we started wondering about, you know, a lot of people who do clinical trials of acupuncture use non-penetrating needles, where the needle is uh, blunt, you know, it's cut, the tip is cut off, and they're simply pressing against the skin in, in one spot in, in, to mimic the sensation <laughs> that the patients get during acupuncture. And it's a pretty effective sham. People actually feel uh, what happens there, and they, they, a lot of times, well, most of the time, they believe they've had an acupuncture treatment, even though the skin has never been penetrated. So here we've used a, a non-insertive device, which was essentially a needle with a cut tip, uh, versus an insertive device. And what we did is we measured using ultrasound elastography that I just told you. We're able to plot the, the, the tissue displacement in response to the devices using a different amplitude. So for example, here the needle is simply uh, rotated on the surface of the skin without uh, pushing. Here the needle is poked one millimeter, three millimeters, five millimeters in amplitude up and down. And here the needle is inserted at five and, 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 and oscillated up and down five millimeters. And you see that with a non-inserted device, with three millimeters of up and down motion, you get more connective tissue displacement than with the inserted uh, device with five millimeters. Okay? What that means is that the non-insertive devices is very, very effective at mechanically stimulating connective tissue. And we think, we, we think the reason for that is because the diameter of these devices is so small that the stress is concentrated in a very, very small area of the skin. And it, and it really is very effective at transferring the force deep. So, you know, the jury is still out as to what the sham acupuncture needles are, are doing uh, in clinical trials. So we're really planning on, on testing that. We think it's very uh, potentially very important. So why do the fibroblasts do this? Why do they bother to change shape 
and do all this uh, work, you know, of changing shape uh, and re-altering their whole cytoskeleton and morphological appearance in response to uh, the mechanical stimulation. You know, what is the point of this? So, uh, we did an experiment where um, we, we wanted to see if there's any possibility that this change in uh, fibroblast shape is related somehow to the tension in the tissue. Now, if you think about connective tissue, right, connective tissue is not typically considered to be actively regulated in its own level of tension. A muscle, on the other hand, right, if you look at a muscle and, and you measure how stiff a muscle is, right, the stiffness of the muscle is really dependent on whether the muscle is contracted or not, right? If a muscle actively contracts, it becomes stiffer. There's another component to the stiffness of muscle, which is, of course, the passive stiffness of the tissue, the viscoelastic properties of the tissue, independent of active cellular activity. But most people who study connective tissue, in biomechanics, for example, consider connective tissue to be entirely a passive viscoelastic material. It's not considered to be actively cellular, cellularly regulated, in a sense. The tension is not considered to be actively regulated by cells. So we wondered, however, if the fibroblast might not do exactly that. So what we did is we took a piece of this little connective tissue from a mouse, and we put it between grips, and we stretched it using a very, very sensitive strain gauge that is able to record the force in millinewtons, which is, you know, that's a small amount of force, but it's measurable. And what you do, if you look first at the blue tracing here, okay, these are the control uh, tissues, and you stretch the tissue and then it relaxes, okay, and it has this very characteristic, what's called a viscoelastic relaxation curve. Okay, the tissue first relaxes and then kind of settles at a given amount, given level of tension, and it, then it stabilizes there after several minutes. Then we compared that to some tissue that had been where the, the um, that had been treated with colchicine, and colchicine is a drug that depolymerizes the microtubules of the cell. And the microtubules are very important parts of the cytoskeleton of the cell that allows the cell to maintain its shape, okay? So colchicine prevents that from happening. As you can see, this is tissue, control tissue, tissue is stretched in the presence of colchicine, the cells are very small. They're both stretched, but the cells do not expand when you give it colchicine. You can see here, the red curve represents the viscoelastic relaxation of connective tissue with colchicine, and it relaxes at a higher level of tension. It means it does not relax as much, okay? So the cells, the active, effect, the active component of the cells is causing the cells, the tissue, to relax further. This is active tissue relaxation, okay? So we think this is really important if the tissue is lengthened, that the cells are enabling the tissue to relax at a lower level of basal tension. So we followed up with these experiments using all different kinds of pharmacological inhibitors. And uh, you can see here the control is the blue, uh, excuse me, the black tracing. And the red uh, is the, excuse me, not the red, the, uh, the blue is the colchicine. Sorry, I have the color of the first one. But anyway, the colchicine is the one I already showed you. And then there's two other um, drugs here. One is sodium azide. Sodium azide essentially just kills the cells. Okay, it does the same thing as colchicine. And then the other one is rokinase. Okay, rokinase is an important um, component of the cell that regulates actin myosin contractility in the cytoskeleton. And you see that rokinase inhibited the, the cells and did exactly the same thing that colchicine did. However, the RAC, RAC1 inhibitor, which is the red tracing here, is, did, did not do anything, okay? And that's another cytoskeletal uh, component. And the, the important thing here, if you look at this cell here, rokinase is what allows the cell to contract its actin bundles, whereas RAC is what allows actin to polymerize at the periphery of the cell to make these lamellopodia, these extensions of cytoplasm that I was talking about. So you see here that what is important, so the same, so the, the three pharmacological inhibitors here that prevented the cell from, from regulating its tension uh, had to do with, you know, reorganization of the cytoskeleton 
and act in contractility, but not form